my fellow believers. Not many of you should be teachers. <laughs> I thought it fairly ironic that in a class where we're learning how to be teachers, the Lord kept on leading me to, the, to this passage that, that starts off like this. It's so, so strange. And so, yeah, I think the Lord has something for us specifically today uh, as, as we learn to teach his word. So if you guys want to begin turning to James 3, uh, that would be awesome. I want to make a particular note as you're turning there that the passage right before this speaks a lot about faith and deeds. And then there's this awkward, not very smooth transition into this literary unit, and, uh, and we'll return to that when it's important. And so James begins, and he says, not many of you should become teachers. He identifies his audience. People who want to be teachers is who he's trying to talk to. He's trying to talk to us. <clears throat> and, and then he gives them, okay, why, why are we talking? We're talking because if you want to be a teacher, you need to know that you will be judged more strictly. So we are the audience. And what we want to get across today, what we want to learn today, is, is why we're going to be judged more strictly. And, and James does fill that out. Because the people in his day had this misconception of what it meant to be judged as a teacher. I don't want us to fall into that same trap. So, so he starts off with us and he says, we all stumble in many ways. Thank you, James, for pointing out the obvious. Yes, we do all sin. However, if there is any one of you who is never at fault in what they say, then they are perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. If you can control everything you say, then you will be perfect. And he, and he kind of gives us a couple examples to, to fill out what that means. He says, when we put the bit, put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body but it makes great boasts. Tongue, really little thing, just like a rudder, can control a huge body, like a ship, our own bodies. However, James does give us the lens as well to be looking at those illustrations, because the tongue can do great things. The tongue can lead entire conver congregations, can lead our own bodies. But it says, consider what a great forest, a big thing, is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a world of evil. It is a fire. So when you look back at the ship analogy, you, you find out that it's not Captain Jack Sparrow who's steering the ship. It's Davy Jones. The, the tongue is evil, and he wants to get that across. He wants us to know the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. He, he really wants to get this point home. The tongue is evil. And he continues on. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. Kind of goes back to verse 2, where he was talking about, if you can control your tongue, then, then you're perfect. You can, you can control your whole body. He just wants to let you know that that's completely hypothetical, and that's not even an option. No human being can tame the tongue. So not only is he leaving us in this hopeless state where the tongue is evil, but you can't even control it. Though, of course, through divine grace, it could be possible to control the tongue. But James doesn't even explore that option, and he continues on. He says, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in his likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Ah! Okay, good. He's getting, he's getting to the solution to this evil, untamable tongue. 
And brothers and sisters, this, this shouldn't be that good and evil come out of your tongue. So he gives us a couple other examples. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs? Ah! He's, he's talking like Jesus. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he uses this, this illustration of, of only a good tree bear, bears good fruit and only a bad tree can bear bad fruit. Oh, yeah, awesome, James. Thank you. But there is one marvelous <coughs> difference between what Jesus has to say about the fruit and, and what James has to say. Jesus says, okay, good fruit, bad fruit. Now go and bear good fruit. Go and build your house on the rock. James, on the other hand, kind of leaves us hanging. says, well, if, if you've got salty water and fresh water coming out of the same spring, all you get is salty water, something that's vile, defile, bitter. All he says is it's just not good to have good and evil come out of the same place. And so when we look at this literary unit, It doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, it's all he said is the tongue is evil. Thanks, James. So I, I want to propose that we, we not take Jesus' solution and in, impose it onto James' text, but rather look at the context in which this passage is found so that we can see what James is trying to say. Because if we don't, we run the chance of betraying what James is trying to convey. So, so what we want to notice is that the passage right before this is a passage on faith and deeds. And the passage just following this is a passage on wisdom and deeds. And I think James is trying to tell us something about that. So he says in verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Here he goes again. He's talking to those who would be teachers. He's talking to us again. Because those people would seemingly be wise. Those who are wise among you, let them show it by their good life, by their deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Wisdom isn't about the tongue. He's just spent 11 verses destroying the fact that wisdom isn't a head knowledge thing that comes out of your mouth. And he, he wants to get across to us who want to be teachers that the teachers will not be judged by, what they, by merely what they've taught, but rather how well they've followed that teaching. I want you to look at it like this. It's kind of like what we've been doing in this class. You go away from the class and you do all your prep work for the sermon and you go and then you bring in two binders full of prep work and you put that on David Ernst's desk. Oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> but if, after you've done all of that, and you stand up here and the only thing you can say is mumbo jumbo, and not a single person can understand what you're saying, then all of that is worthless. In the same sense, if you get up here, and you preach with all knowledge, and all eloquence, and all inspiration, but you can't put into practice what you preach, then your preaching is worthless. Because as teachers, we won't be judged solely on what we've taught, but on how well we follow that teaching. And so I want to challenge you guys that as you go home for Christmas, as you go home to your families, that you show them what it means to be a teacher. That, that you, you show them all the prep work that's been 
going on in your heart through this, this semester of classes and chapels that you, because it's really hard to tell them what it's like. So go home and act in humility. Don't spend time with your friends when, when you really want to. Spend time with your family. Do some chores when you're at home. Walk the dog and do some baking and, and decorate the house and do the dishes, even though it's your break. Participate in the Advent Conspiracy and give them the gift of presence. But ultimately, what I challenge you guys to do, I want you to really, really be intentional about selflessly giving yourselves to your family. In the name of the Father, 